So much for the dog days of summer. Two landmark pieces of legislation, a major river runs dry, inflation takes a holiday, and the FBI searches former President Trump's Mar-a-Lago residence. Welcome to August. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David West. This week, special contributor Larry Summers on not counting our chickens too soon on inflation. We've sort of seen this movie before. And Melissa Carney of the University of Maryland on the risk of running out of workers. Our population is going to age and it's not going to grow. Eventually, we're going to have a shrinking working age population. Things are supposed to be quiet in August, but the news gods haven't gotten that message. The week started off dramatically as dozens of FBI agents executed a warrant to search former President Trump's Mar-a-Lago residence. Trump allies were quick to comment. It's unprecedented that you would go into a former president. Why wouldn't they just ask the president if they have something there that they want? But Attorney General Merrick Garland waited until the end of the week before weighing in. I personally approve the decision to seek a search warrant in this matter. Second, the department does not take such a decision lightly. And then on Friday, we got to see the warrant and what was taken. The FBI has again seized classified records, some that were marked as top secret from former President Donald Trump's Mar-a-Lago home. And this was a copy of the search warrant that was seen by Bloomberg. Congress moved forward on not one, but two pieces of major legislation, that CHIPS Act that's been pending forever. The United States must lead the world in the production of these advanced chips. This law will do exactly that. And a piece or two of the Build Back Better proposal that had been left for dead, but came back like Lazarus at the 11th hour and the 59th minute. The motion is adopted. <laughs> And though summer in the Northern Hemisphere is supposed to be hot, not so hot that Europe's Rhine River dries up, posing yet another problem for strained supply chains. It's also just getting extremely expensive. Uh, the same barge owner I was speaking to before, he said that he literally fell off his chair when he saw the, the cost of shipping on the Rhine. But as hot as things were everywhere else, inflation chose this week to cool down a bit with headline CPI numbers flat month over month and core up less than expected. Though, to be fair, we still are facing more inflation than anyone would like. It is good news, although I do think we have to be cautious. As we've said all along, there's no silver bullet here. And after the producer price index numbers reinforced the idea that inflation just might be softening a bit, the markets responded warmly, with the S&P 500 posting its fourth weekly climb in a row, up 3.26 percent, and the Nasdaq back in bull territory, up over 3 percent, while bonds were relatively calm, with the yield on the 10-year ending the week not far from where it started at 2.83 percent. Here to help us sort it all out are Joanne Feeney, Portfolio Manager at Advisors Capital Management, and Christina Hooper, Chief Global Market Strategist at Invesco. So welcome to both of you. Christina, let me start with you on the reaction of the markets to this uh, CPI and PPI numbers, some encouragement. Uh, does it sort of suggest maybe we're heading in a better direction? David, we're definitely heading in a better direction. Um, it looks like we're past peak for inflation, but the problem is inflation is still very, very high. If we think about the Fed's inflation target of 2 percent, we're way far away from that, and it's going to take us a significant amount of time to get there. Um, but this is the first step in that direction, and so it's progress. Joanne, I think the market yeah. sort of thought maybe we can back off a little bit. Well, the market, I think, might be a little bit too optimistic about how much work the Fed still has to do. Uh, yes, uh, the numbers have been good. In fact, uh, core PC inflation looks like it peaked back in March. Um, we got that information. And that's a positive. And we're starting to see some of those items that were in really short supply uh, now start to become more available. And that's helping to take the price pressure off. But we are, as Christina said, we are a long way from 2% uh, inflation. Although the long-term expectation for inflation is, uh, you know, closer to 2%, we still have a lot of work. The Fed has a lot of work to do in the short term. So I think the market might be a little bit too optimistic uh, about the path of rate increases. Uh, and I think they're going to continue to rise over the next you know, few meetings at least until the Fed is really convinced that inflation is moving in the right direction. And because they're data driven, they're going to wait until enough data has really piled up before they shift their focus, I think. 
So, Christina, take us over the next month and a half or so, because we got Jackson Hole first, right? We'll hear from Fed speakers, including Jay Powell. And then there's a fair amount of data. I think we get another CPI reading or two. We get jobs numbers reading, things like that. Where do you think the Fed will be come September? Mm. Well, I'm actually going to go out on a limb, David, and say we're probably going to be in a place where the Fed feels it should err on the side of a little more caution, right? We've gone at a pretty breakneck speed in terms of back-to-back -back 75 basis point hikes. And the Fed is, as Joanne said, very data dependent. So it's going to be looking at data and seeing that longer term inflation expectations are better anchored than they were. Um, and they are going to see inflation moving in the right direction. Uh, inflation growth uh, is obviously still an issue. So they're going to be hiking rates, but they don't have to be as aggressive. So perhaps they signal it in a Jackson Hole speech that might be too premature. But I think by the time we get to September, October, we should see a Fed that pivots to a less hawkish tightening stance. You know, I think the critical data, uh, in addition to what you just mentioned, Christina, is going to be the employee cost index, that ECI. Right? We know the labor market is very tight and we're concerned, right, that wages are going to continue to rise. And that's going to put a floor really under price inflation as those bleed through into prices from firms. And we're seeing that a lot. We're seeing firms actually be pretty successful at raising prices in the face of those higher costs. So, you know, if if job openings drop and some of the, the heat comes out of the labor market it, and we don't get as large increases in wages and overall uh, employee costs, then I could see the Fed, you know, uh, becoming a little bit more at ease about uh, the number of rate increases. But right now, the wage pressure just looks really severe and companies are still clamoring for workers, even as we hear about these anecdotes of, of Peloton, you know, firing hundreds more workers and, and others. But a lot of those that are, you know, announcing uh, firings are the ones that were right in the center of the pandemic benefit in terms of just massive business expansion. And they're now having to dial back. So we'll see if that spreads more broadly across the economy. Joanne, I would argue some of the heat is already coming out of the job market, that we've seen a drop in the number of job openings. It's moving in the right direction. And of course, we are seeing companies in uh, earnings calls talking about how they're going to be more cautious in hiring or actually uh, implementing hiring freezes. And of course, we have heard about some layoffs as well. So I think this is an environment in which we're going to see um, uh, increasingly lower level of labor um, mobility. And so that should help tamp down uh, upward wage pressure. Yeah, Joanne, I'm curious yeah. about your take on the risks faced on the one hand by the markets and on the other hand by the Fed and whether it's the same because there is a risk in backing off too quickly. I mean, we, we say, boy, the inflation is down headline and core, but it's still pretty high. And even with wage increases, they may not be as high as they were. They're still pretty high. Uh, for the Fed, they, do they have to really be concerned about the appearance that they're backing off too soon? Yeah, I think they do have to be concerned about that because their their main tool for getting this right is creating the correct expectations. They really have to convince the market firms, uh, workers who might be out there clamoring for raises. They have to convince them that this inflation spike is a temporary one, and, and so to back off, you know, too soon would potentially, you know, lead the markets to think, okay, this could get out of control. I agree with Christina. We have seen some softening in, 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 uh, in the labor markets. Job openings did, did come down a bit, but there's still nearly twice the number of the unemployed. And that could be a little bit of a mirage, right? We, we could see more, uh, more firings, and that's a backward-looking data point we know. So, you know, that's why I think we will know a fair bit more over the next couple of months. But the Fed, I think, cannot err on the side of looking like they're going to ease off if the data is not really strongly supportive. Christina, we have to talk about the possibility of a recession and the yield curve, because we've had the twos, tens now inverted for an extended period of time. It's somewhere in the 30s right now. It got as high as 58. What do you see in terms of the risk of a recession at this point? Well, actually, David, I would argue this week was a good week um, that increased our chances of avoiding a real full-blown um, broad recession. Uh, I think the Fed, uh, it's going to be a little bit easier for the Fed to execute a soft landing, but that would mean that the Fed needs to pivot to a less hawkish tightening stance sooner rather than later. Do you agree with that, Joanne? What do you think about the chances of a recession? Well, you know, I think it's uh, probably the case that things got a little bit brighter in terms of the outlook with the data we got this week with those inflation numbers coming in below expectations. You know, clearly uh, short-term interest rates can go up 
uh, even significantly without triggering an inflation. What we're watching is really the longer term interest rates, right? So the yield curve being inverted doesn't surprise us. It seems actually kind of a natural outcome of the Fed trying to deal with what hopefully will be a short term inflation problem. So you have, you know, the shorter term interest rates, the, the, the three month, the two year, et cetera, spiking up a little bit as the Fed moves. But provided that the 10 year remains anchored close to the level where it's currently sitting, that doesn't then materially raise the cost of doing business for firms. It doesn't raise mortgages as much. It doesn't raise the cost of financing durable goods purchases. So it would tend to have less of a, of a drive towards, you know, any recessionary dynamic than just having the short-term rates go up. Christina Hooper of Invesco and Joanne Feeney of Advisors Capital Management will be staying with us as we turn from the markets generally to what investors can do about them. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Housing start reversed a four-month decline, and the overall economy grew in the spring at a modest 2.3 percent annual rate, but amid signs that inflation was again easing. That wasn't good news for everyone this week. The oil market stepped into a poodle, with the price taking its biggest one-day hit in almost a year, and every currency in sight took a bite out of the dollar. That was Louis Ruckheiser's take on the economy on Wall Street Week back in 1987. Now, 35 years later, we're still focused on housing and energy and growth, but from a very different vantage point. Joanne Feeney of Capital Management and Christina Hooper of uh, Invesco are still with us. So, Joanne, let me start with you, if I could. Uh, let's talk about housing, because there's a lot of talk about housing right now, whether we, in fact, are in a bubble. Obviously, housing prices have gone up a lot. Rent costs are really in record levels in various places. At the same time, the Fed's trying to come off of that sugar high. Yeah, it's um, clearly a reset going on in the housing market. Um, you know, that those low interest rates clearly created a lot of uh, demand, a lot of activity in the housing market. But people shouldn't forget that there's still an awful lot of younger folks out there who have delayed getting into their first, first homes. And, and that latent demand is still out there. And I think what we're seeing now is a reevaluation of how much house can I afford. And so we have seen people walk away from contracts. We've seen the builders slow down a little bit. But given how high mortgage rates are, the existing homeowners don't want to get out of their old cheap mortgages. So that's going to push demand to the new builds. So we're still pretty enthusiastic about some of the plays in the new, uh, you know, in, in new building for housing, like say a Lennar, for example, which tends to serve that lower end, the first home buyer or the one step up home buyer. So there are places to be in housing. Uh, you just have to be a little bit patient here as this reset plays through and folks renegotiate contracts and then find slightly cheaper houses to buy. So, Christina, uh, Christina you heard about Lennar there, maybe, the lower end uh, housing market. What are you seeing? There's a lot of volatility in the marketplace. Where does it create opportunities for investors at this point? Well, it creates opportunities uh, really at, at times when we see um, uh, sell-offs. Of course, we haven't seen much of a sell-off in, in recent weeks, but, but when we do get those, that's an opportunity for investors to reshuffle portfolios, right? And, and sometimes it's about exchanging lower quality, um, less defensive for higher quality, more defensive, getting a little more yield in there. So I think areas that I would focus on right now are, are opportunities in healthcare like pharma, uh, as well as, as technology, the secular growth plays there. Jo Joanne, one of the things obviously that's been driving the U.S. economy sometimes are consumers. Uh, consumers had a pretty good time of it. They've had really good balance sheets. They've got a very, fair amount of uh, income coming in. At the same time, there's more pressure there now. What does that say in terms of investing in stocks if, in fact, there's more pressure on the consumer? Yeah, you know, it's, it's become a very challenging time to invest in the consumer space because what we have going on now is really a tale of two consumers. We have folks at the lower to middle end of the income distribution really being hurt by these high prices, this high inflation. For them, it's making their budgets a lot tighter. And so we're seeing that in the results of, say, a Walmart and a Target, where they're finding their shoppers aren't spending less, but they're switching away from discretionary products towards the necessities, which have lower margins. So it's hurting their profits. But then you look at the higher end of the income distribution, you see companies like Apple selling expensive iPhones. They're not seeing a drop in demand. Or, say, a Williams-Sonoma. Right? They sell higher end uh, you know, kitchen gear and furnishing type stuff, and they're not really seeing a drop. So it really depends what kind of a consumer products company you are. 
and how much you can raise prices because you have a resilient uh, supply of, of shoppers or how much you're having to really trim them back to keep the shoppers walking in the door. And so it does make it a real selection question. And to Christina's point, finding the higher quality companies that have the more resilient shoppers is really going to help uh, your portfolio. David, I would just argue that in this environment, having seen gas prices come down significantly, um, real incomes aren't as pressured now as they were uh, just a little while ago. So I think that that um, chasm between uh, those two sets of consumers might not be as wide. Um, there's a little alleviation of, of the pressure on lower and middle income American households right now just because uh, energy prices have come down. So it's certainly not a, a much better situation, but it is um, materially better. And we saw that borne out in the most recent consumer sentiment numbers. Talk about earnings, if you would, Christina, for a moment. We're just getting through the earnings season here. If we're seeing a tale of two consumers, as we just heard from Joanna, are we seeing a tale of two sets of companies as well, about high quality versus less high quality? Well, certainly there are some companies that are far better able to pass on their costs than others. Um, there are those that are really experiencing a reduction in traffic, for example, if we're looking at some of the retailers, um, and, and others that have, have held up fairly well. So I think, you know, going forward, what we're going to have to make an assessment on is, is which are those higher quality companies that can defend their margins, that can pass on prices, uh, that can weather this storm better. Um, because let's face it, it's going to be, you know, um, there are going to be some significant headwinds in the next two quarters, I would argue. Joanne, as a portfolio manager, how are you feeling about tech these days? I know tech covers an awful lot of sins. There are a lot of different things called tech. But how are you feeling? Are there opportunities right now in tech? Oh, yeah, I think there definitely are. You know, it could take some patience, uh, really, for investors to, to reap the rewards of tech. But when we look at technology, what we look for are companies that are in the middle of a change in the way things are done, a demand coming from the market, whether it's demographics or taste. But, you know, the cloud area, companies shifting their activities away from internal service, say, to the cloud, this is still happening. And more traffic on the Internet is pushing data centers to have to expand and build in faster, wider pipes. So if you look for the companies that supply the parts to enable that, you know, they're going to be able to sell well no matter what happens in terms of the cyclical side of the economy. And generally, if you, if you pick and choose carefully, you can find ones that have deep moats around them, that don't have a lot of competition. You're not buying into companies that are selling commodities. So, you know, whether it's a, a Broadcom or an Amazon, which really enables the cloud, or a, a Microsoft, which enables the software to make all this work, these are companies that are going to power through. They're going to be a little bit cyclical, but they're going to hold up better than others will. Christina, finally, let's go overseas if we could, because uh, we've talked about the Fed. Uh, however fast they're going to tighten, they're tightening, no question about it. Europe looks like they're tightening. There are some places like Japan and China that may be going the other direction. Does that create an opportunity for investors? I think so, David. It's not just a difference in terms of monetary policy. So we both we have China easing and we have Japan remaining very easy. Um, but it's also fiscal stimulus. We're seeing fiscal stimulus in both those countries, whereas in the U.S. and, and other Western developed countries, they're pulling back on stimulus. And so uh, that sets up an environment in which there are built-in tailwinds that we're just not seeing here. I think there's potential there. Now, when we look specifically at China equities, there's a lot of pessimism right now around China, especially given headlines around the property sector. But if you ring fence the property sector, and, and look at, at um, the, the broader market, especially technology. There are a lot of opportunities in China equities, and I think there's the potential for positive surprise. Joanne, what about China? And I'll push Christina here a little bit. It's certainly the property sector, but there are also geopolitical risks. And we saw the delisting of a lot of the big Chinese publicly traded companies because of problems with the United States. There are a lot of frictions here. How do you feel about China? Are there investments that make sense there? You know, we do think there are some good opportunities in China and, and around China. Our international team, which manages a set of internationally oriented portfolios, you know, they're in there, they're picking and choosing very carefully. You don't want to invest in a country as a whole. Like you said, the property issue in China is, is a serious one. But look at the, the cloud enabling companies in China. You know, the political environment in China is still pro-growth, even if they're running into problems with COVID and politics, right? A company like Baidu, for example, or Alibaba, they're going to be able to be uh, the engines of growth in China for many years to come, even with those regulatory questions. And if they get delisted here, right, they're going to be listed in probably Hong Kong. And so even if you're in an ETF, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, stocks in this country, 
listed in New York, even if they switch over to Hong Kong, the investor is going to be fine with that. So it's not as risky from that regulatory perspective, I think, as a lot of people think. And even on the geopolitical side, you have to really understand what the Chinese leadership wants to accomplish. And one thing they want to accomplish is continued growth. So if you look for the companies that enable that, even if they're a little bit more volatile, uh, those could be good places to be, particularly at the valuations at which we're seeing them now. So briefly here at the end, Christina, how do you factor in the geopolitics of it when you appraise uh, possible investment? It's very, very hard to. So I, I think the best course of action is to take a longer term view and recognize that geopolitics can have an impact on the shorter term, rarely on the longer term, rarely on mm. fundamentals, if at all. Um, but use it opportunistically, because if geopolitics drives down stocks, that's an entry opportunity, in my view, as opposed to anything um, that causes concern and, and uh, a run for the exits. Joanne, is that what you do in picking your stocks, look for some uh, low-hanging fruit, as it were? Yeah, I like the way Christina put that. You can't be a short-term investor uh, in this kind of environment if you're going to go internationally, right? There are shocks that are going to happen. There's geopolitical risks. But longer term, right, economies get through cycles. They get through these kinds of risks. Mm. And when you find those opportunities for good, solid companies right. that attract the valuations, you do have to act, act opportunistically. Yep. Sounds like a lot of sense to me. Thank you so much to Christina Hooper of Invesco and Joanne Feeney of Advisors Capital Management. Coming up, we look around the world at what's coming up next week. And that's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. It's time to take a look at next week on Global Wall Street, starting with Juliet Sally in Singapore. Thanks, David. China's July monthly activity data are likely to show the recovery eking out a little more headway. Bloomberg Economics expects industrial production, investment and retail sales all picking up. Elsewhere, Japan's second quarter GDP will probably show a strong rebound that takes output back to pre-COVID levels. Australia's jobs report is likely to show employment stabilising after a few months of strong growth. Plus, we are on interest rate decision watch from the RBNZ and central banks in the Philippines and Sri Lanka. Now over to Tom McKenzie in London. Tom? Here in Europe, we're going to be looking ahead to the earnings from the bailed out utility giant over in Germany, Uniper, at a time of potential blackouts and rationing when it comes to energy, particularly around the winter months. It's the forecast from some. And when it comes to that energy crisis, of course, a drag on the Eurozone growth picture. We're going to be getting GDP out next week from the continent at a time when increasingly economists are forecasting a recession. And sticking with the energy theme, we're going to be speaking to the the new Secretary General of OPEC, of course, to get a sense of where we stand in terms of supply, demand and pricing for oil. Big week here in the U.S., really on the earnings front. We're going to get a big update with Home Depot and Lowe's, of course. Housing, as you know, has been a really big bright spot here during COVID in the U.S. With some of the economic data that we're going to get around that as well. Does that continue or are we really starting to see a significant slowdown in the face of rising rates? I want to stick with retail and some of the earnings as well next week. We talked a lot about the consumer. Walmart, Target, TJ Maxx, Kohl's all set to report next week as well. And we've talked a lot on our programs about sort of how inflation has hit the lower end consumer much harder than some of the luxury and retailers. So that will be a key focus for us here as well. Back to you, David. Thanks to Juliet Sally, Tom McKenzie and Taylor Riggs. Coming up, we ask our special contributor Larry Summers whether those CPI numbers have him feeling any better about inflation. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. To take us through the high points of this week, we welcome back our very special contributor, Larry Summers of Harvard. So, Larry, thank you so much for joining us from Aspen, actually, this week. We'll talk a little later about what you're doing out there. But first, we got CPI numbers this week. On Wednesday, they came in significantly better than a lot of people thought they would. So uh, do you find some relief from this? Are we over the worst of it when it comes to inflation? 
I think these were encouraging numbers. We, we knew that the headline number was going to be coming substantially down because we could see what had happened with gasoline prices. The core number was better than most people uh, expected. Uh, that's certainly better than the alternative uh, to that. On the other hand, it was heavily driven by volatile sectors like used cars, like hotels, like airfares. We've sort of seen this movie before. We had a terrific core number in March, but it was from those volatile sectors, and then it bounced back up in April, May, and June. So we'll have to see uh, what happens going forward, but this is certainly a better number than most people uh, expected, and it will come as a bit of relief uh, to the Fed. But I certainly think it's nothing like we are out of the woods. It's nothing like a fundamental change in uh, the orientation. It's nothing that means that we can pivot away from the overwhelming paradigm being a need for restrictive policy to contain inflation. Well, that's what I want to ask you about. Some relief for the Fed, you said. Is there a risk in that? You've warned me before about backing off too quickly in the cooling of the economy. Is there a risk the Fed pays too much attention to numbers like these? We'll have to, we'll have to see what they do. Uh, if the Fed regards this as a major game changer, they will be making another major mistake. I would be surprised if they regarded it that way, because I think when you look within it, you'll see that seasonally adjusted airfares coming out of two Julys when airfares were highly distorted by COVID. How could you take that seriously as a huge harbinger of new uh, trends? So I don't think they will make uh, that kind of mistake. They certainly shouldn't make that kind of mistake. But, you know, you get out of woods uh, and even deep woods, you get out of them one step at a time. So I don't want to deny that this is that there's some encouragement uh, in this number. But overreacting uh, to that would be a grave mistake. I think on your show before, David, I've talked about uh, how prudent people finish their regimen of antibiotics even as they're gratified four days in that they feel better. Learn. And I still think that's the right metaphor for thinking about uh, this situation. Larry, you and I have talked a lot about rates. What about the balance sheet? Because I'm going to say just about every week after we get done on this program, uh, somebody emails me and says, what about the balance sheet? How effective is the balance sheet in helping to slow down the economy, get our arms around inflation? And are they doing it the right way? Should they be coming off the balance sheet even faster than they are? I wonder if they should come off uh, faster uh, than they are. I think the clearest statement about the balance sheet is that they should have stopped buying six or nine months earlier than they did. I think it's clear that we had something that history will look back on as a bit of a housing bubble. And I think they contributed to that by buying mortgage-backed securities. Now, I certainly think they're going in the right direction with QT rather than uh, QE. Could they do it faster? Perhaps they could. Would it make a major difference? I'm not sure that it would. Would it add to financial risk? It might in terms of some kind of accident in markets. Uh, in general, David, I think that yields are driven more by the fundamentals of what's happening in the economy and less by central bank policies like uh, QT and QE that I think many in the markets think, you know, I could be right about that or I could be uh, or I could be wrong. But I think people often ascribe to the direct impact of these policies what is in fact a signaling with respect to future monetary policies. And I don't think that now the, this is an area of stability. The Fed has set an expectation. That expectation is underway. I wouldn't be recommending 
a major change in balance sheet policies at, uh, at this point. Larry, when we spoke last week, the Inflation Reduction Act was getting toward being statute. Now we actually have pen put to paper. One of the issues that has been uh, of concern to you is carried interest. You were concerned, actually, they should go further in cutting back in carried interest. In the end, they went even less far. What do you make of what happened there, particularly with some of the lobbying we saw on Capitol Hill? I think it's very sad how much uh, special interest lobbyists were able to stop things that are clearly in uh, the public interest. The idea that carried interest, which after all is income paid to people who work at providing a service. Some people provide the service of legal work. Some people provide uh, the service of serving meals. Some people provide the service of asset management. And the idea that the people who provide the service of asset management, who are often some of the best paid people in our country, should be able to have their compensation be taxed at half the rate of everybody else, I think is outrageous. And I think it's very sad that people on the progressive side allowed themselves to be persuaded by very substantial donors to their campaigns that the legislation as it was originally drafted should be gutted uh, in that area. I also think it's very unfortunate, even more unfortunate, because it's in some ways a, a larger uh, issue, that the hugely historically important legislation or tr in agreement that Secretary Yellen reached with President Biden very much involved to foster international tax cooperation, that's probably going to collapse now or may well collapse because Congress wouldn't pass the enabling legislation by going after tax havens. And I sure wish that that had happened. I hope that the, right. some way will be found uh, to go back to that set of issues. And frankly, David, it all has me uh, thinking about uh, the role of money and business interests in our system. As you know, I am hardly one who takes the perspective of uh, the most uh, progressive wing of the Democratic Party, most left wing of the Democratic Party that wants to see things socialized or wants to see punitive uh, taxes uh, levied. I tend to be on the more moderate uh, side. But I am pretty offended by what's happened here. And I think uh, business leaders who lobbied these provisions, right. who want to ex be explaining about public-private cooperation in the national and global interest and all of that, I think they should always be asked, uh, shouldn't they start by not lobbying to subvert the tax system we have? Okay, Larry Summers, I'm delighted to say you'll be staying with us because we're going to be joined by Melissa Carney. She's a professor of economics at Maryland, and she has convened Larry and some other esteemed economists in Aspen to address the very important question of after we come through whatever downturn we're going through, where will the growth come from? That's coming up next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. Our special contributor, Larry Summers, has stayed with us. And we are joined now by Melissa Carney. She's professor of economics at the University of Maryland, also director of the Aspen Economic Strategy Group, which she has convened in Aspen this week with Larry and other esteemed economists to address a critical question, really, of whether the United States could be facing stagflation. So, Melissa, welcome to Wall Street Week. Great to have you here. Let's start with the question of where growth will come on the other side of whatever it is we're going through, because that's ultimately going to be the question here. I understand from economists like you, it comes from one of two sources, either more workers or more productivity. Are we going to get more workers? We're looking at both fewer workers and lower productivity, as you know. So let me focus on the fewer workers uh, aspect for a moment. The real issue, demographic issue facing the U.S. is we have a plummeting birth rate. And so total fertility in the U.S. 
is now below the level required to keep population growth constant. And so the issue here is that on average now, a woman in the U.S. is expected to have 1.65 children over her lifetime. So women used to have three kids, then it fell to two. Women were having comfortably above two kids for many decades. With a, with a fertility rate below two, that means our population is going to age and it's not going to grow. And so eventually we're going to have a shrinking working age population. Unless, Melissa, we have uh, immigration. That's right. And that's why <laughs> immigration, I think many of us at this conference feel is so very, very important. What's your sense of what economists would say, the politics apart, um, about the immigration policy? Economists love immigration. We think immigration is a, is a potential answer to our demographic challenges, as well as our productivity innovation challenges. Since immigrants come in, they work, they're more likely than native-born Americans to be entrepreneurs and innovators. Of course, as you know, Larry, immigration rates are way down. So we used to bring in, as you know, 2016, we had as many as a million new people coming into the country every year. That number is now below 250,000. And so the combination of a declining native-born population and a decline in immigration portends even worse demographic challenges than if we were just facing one versus the other. Let me see if I can do a little arithmetic based on what you said. From 1 million to yeah. 250,000. Yeah. So that's about 750,000 people a year. So that's about half a percent of our workforce, maybe a little less. So half a percent slower labor force uh, growth over time can accumulate to something uh, that, is very, that is very large. And, and if we go back to the birth rates, we have about 500,000 fewer babies being born a year than in the not distant past. Melissa, if you, um, what would you say about, about this? Um, most people are scared that immigrants come and they take jobs for Americans. And that if there are more immigrants, then there aren't gonna be as many jobs for Americans. Or if there are jobs, because there's more competition, uh, they're going to be paid less. And that's true whether the job people think is working at McDonald's or is uh, working doing computer programming at Microsoft. What, how do you, how should people feel? Shouldn't they, ha shouldn't they have this worry that they're gonna be poorer if we take all the immigrants, just like they get hurt if we take a lot of, low, a lot of trade from other countries right. where they have much lower wages? So, so, so the reason economists are so bullish on immigration is because we have so much evidence that immigrants are good for the economy. They are good for most workers. But it is true that there are some groups in some places that will feel wage pressures. And I think the way we, the way we solve this issue is to make sure that we recognize the disparate impacts of certain groups. We recognize that low wage workers in certain sectors might not experience the benefits, the overall benefits that immigrants bring to the economy. And we take steps to help them. I mean, it's not, it's not dissimilar to what we have to do with trade too. You know, more imports is good for most people, but some people are harmed by it. We're going to see this too with the shift to green, a greener um, economy. Some people are going to lose their jobs, even though it's better for everyone. And so, I mean, I, I think acknowledging that some people feel and are harmed by this, but that's a small concentrated group and taking steps to address that allows us to do things that make the economy grow and, right. and be more productive. Sorry, Melissa, I wanted to come back to fertility. Larry's pointed out a way in which economics, whether misperceived or not, may affect our willingness to have immigration. What about fertility? Are there economic causes for the reduction in fertility? So the decline in U.S. fertility, and it's really being driven by a plummeting of birth rates since 2007. Births fell after the Great Recession. They haven't recovered. Um, you can't point to any, any policy or economic factor that's changed since 2007. So sometimes people will say things like child care has become more expensive, and if we just made child care less expensive, people would return to having more than two kids. I, I, there, I just, not, that is just not the case, right? There's nothing, uh, there's nothing that easy that we could point to. And in fact, U.S. women now are just having births in the same way that 
women in other high income countries have reduced their birth rates long before in the 80s and 90s. So I don't think this is going to be easy to turn around. Lots of other countries have taken direct steps to try and incentivize people to have more kids. There's a lot of countries that have experimented with baby bonuses, a few thousand dollars. Birth rates go up a little bit in the following year, but nothing like the 20% increase in infertility we would need to get back to replacement level. Melissa, having an expert like you here, I can't resist uh, stepping out of our mutual lane as economists to ask a question I suspect is on many people's minds. Do you think that the recent Supreme Court decision and the steps that are going to be taken in a number of states do you think that's going to materially affect the number of births in the United States? The, we do have estimates on this based, based on you know, lots of data we have about how abortion restrictions you know, lead to more birth rates. I expect there will be about uh, 100,000 more births a year. Um, so uh, yes, not, th this, is, this is not going to bring fertility rates back to where they were. This is going to mean that some women who wouldn't want to have a child now are going to. Um, since you raised the issue, I will say that this makes the imperative of doing more to support kids and low-income women in this country that much stronger. Hmm. Which is, you know, that, that was something that Congress was talking about for a brief moment uh, in the initial Build Back Better. That stuff got jettisoned. In the post Dobbs decision paradigm, we are going to have some more births disproportionately born to low income women, and we need to talk about how we're going to make sure that those children are well taken care of. So, Larry, can we make up uh, the loss of uh, population and workers with productivity? We have the Chips and Science Act now, we have the Inflation Reduction Act, both of which I understand are meant to increase productivity. Can we make it up in increased productivity? You know, Melissa organized a terrific session here on uh, R&D and science leadership uh, issues. I think there's a lot we can do, but it's both about spending money and it's about spending it well. There was the famous discovery of DNA by Crick and Watson. Today, people can't usually get their first grant until they're over 40. Hmm. And so I think we need to change the systems as well as putting more resources in if we want to maximize science, innovation, and their capacity for productivity. I think we've also got to have to think about a lot of things uh, post-COVID. David, can I, there's one other factor here. So we've talked about fewer working age people, less productivity per worker. We also have fewer working age people working. So the decline in labor force participation among people between the ages of 25 to 54 is yet another challenge that we're going to have to deal with in this country that's negatively going to impact growth going forward. It used to be that 95% of working age men were working. Today, it's 85% are working. That is an extra 10% of people who aren't having the satisfaction of work, aren't contributing to the economy, are much less well-placed to raise healthy, successful uh, families, are often angered and alienated uh, from our society. And so we tend to think of, on shows like this, uh, the path of... Uh, fortunate college-educated uh, workers, we have got to be uh, thinking about that large group of men, men much more than women, who are uh, really struggling uh, in our country right now and what can be done um, from childhood on to maximize their opportunities. Yeah, it, it's such an important point, and as you know, both of you know well, there's been some serious economic work suggesting that opioids actually have been a non, not insignificant contributor to that problem. Thank you so much. It's been a great discussion. I wish I were out there and asked with you. I could learn a lot more. But thank you so much to our very special contributor, Larry Summers of Harvard, and Melissa Carney, professor of economics at the University of Maryland. Coming up, it's one thing to handpick your successor. It's quite another to make it work. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Finally, 
one more thought. Heavy is the head that wears the crown, at least according to Shakespeare's Henry IV. And it's not only heavy, it's hard to pass that crown onto the next head, at least judging by how often it doesn't seem to work. We don't have to go all the way back to Lear to find leaders bungling their succession plans. We have divided in three our kingdom. It is our fast intent to shake all cares and business from our age, conferring them on younger strengths. We all know how that worked out for King Lear. There are plenty of more recent examples, though, particularly in the world of business, like Jack Welch anointing Jeff Immelt to carry on his legend at GE, something that didn't work out so well, although Jeff seemed to be the last to know when he spoke to our John Micklesweight in 2017, not long before he had his crown removed. We always have a group of successors, and I always think you, you got to earn it every day. So I've yeah, been doing it a while. I feel great, and we'll see where it goes. Or Kevin Johnson, who had the bad fortune to be the second CEO to replace Starbucks chief Howard Schultz, only to be succeeded by, you guessed it, Howard Schultz. Though when I spoke with Kevin in 2019, he admitted that it was tricky. In a transition from founder-led to founder-inspired, those transitions oftentimes are the most difficult and the most critical transition that any company will go through. And this week, we got yet another example. When the founders of the Carlyle Group announced that their hand-picked heir Kusan Lee would be leaving abruptly to be replaced, at least temporarily, by Bill Conway, one of those founders who'd picked him. This has definitely shaken the investment universe. Let's not be coy about it. 10 p.m. Eastern on a Sunday night. Uh, and remember, like I said, he is stepping down before the contract is even up. But it wasn't only Q Lee who stepped down this week. We also saw a legend prepare to move on when Serena Williams, arguably the greatest of all time in women's tennis, announced that she would be retiring after the U.S. Open this year, something she had just joked about earlier. Every tennis player thinks about the R word as soon as they hit five years. <laughs> and when it comes to Serena, I'm not sure that we're going to see any successor anytime soon. So given how much drama there is around the subject, it shouldn't be surprising that there is a hit TV drama series given over to the matter of succession. Because it's one thing to know the boss has to go, it's quite another to figure out who should be the new boss, especially if you're warring with family members. He's erratic. He's making bad decisions. If he's not careful, he's going to destroy the company. And what, are you going to do something? I think I'm the best option. Oh, right, because you like playing boss? That does it for this episode of Wall Street Week. I'm David West, and this is Bloomberg. See you next week.